13 years ago, before the invasion of Iraq, my husband and I brought our children to a peace rally. It was a sunny day in a grassy park, and there were probably about 30 people standing around with a microphone, basically giving speeches to each other. And my daughter, who was only six at the time, looked up at me and said, Mom, this is not going to change George Bush's mind. Can we go get ice cream? <laughs> I dragged my kids to peace rallies for a few more years before I realized she was right. But I didn't quite totally give up on political change. I decided that maybe changing who was in the White House was the way to go. <clears throat> so I worked on that angle. Sound familiar? Right now, we have a lot of people on both ends of the political spectrum who are really frustrated with their inability to get things that they want. And so there's a lot of excitement about maybe changing who's in the White House. But my message tonight is though that is important, what I've found in the last several years is that there's another way to make change, a way that doesn't rely on convincing or replacing political leaders, but a way that relies on tapping our own power. So I'm gonna tell you some stories tonight of what I've learned about that. Now the thing that drew me into this was climate change. The more I learned about drought and famine and flood and hurricanes, the more I felt like we really need a president who's gonna deal with this, right? <clears throat> and so I worked a lot on President Obama's election. He was talking about climate change as well as talking about ending the wars. But a funny thing happened after the election. He stopped talking about climate change for his whole first term. And I gradually began to realize that the fossil fuel industry had so much political power that electing someone who understood the problem was not the same as solving the problem. I also started to learn about some of the really horrifying things that fossil fuel companies are doing that's fueling climate change, such as mountaintop removal coal mining. They literally blow up the tops of mountains dump the debris in the valley below, which is full of heavy metals. It causes cancer and birth defects in the nearby communities. And afterward, the mountains are really eerie. There's no sound because there's no birds, no squirrels, no trees. Sometimes the coal companies throw a little bit of grass around and call it reclaimed. But the truth is those mountains are dead. And as I learned about these things, I just started feeling a lot of despair about the world that my children would inherit. I also felt like I should be doing something, that I was maybe even called to do something about these issues. Now, I should tell you that I'm a Quaker. And if you don't know what that means, we are not the Amish. We today are more likely to drive a Prius than a horse and buggy. The things we're known for are our long history of commitment to social justice and peace issues. And we're also known for this idea that every person, regardless of their background, can access the divine directly. We can hear God's guidance for our lives, which is one of the reasons we often worship in silence. So I hear I had this feeling that I was called to do something, but I didn't know what to do. A turning point came just about five years ago when I had a really strong intuition to go to the Philadelphia Flower Show. Now, if you've been there, you know, big convention center, they haul in a ton of dirt and plant, elaborate gardens. <clears throat> At the time, the main financial sponsor was PNC Bank. And I had heard, but forgotten, that PNC was also one of the biggest financiers of mountaintop removal coal mining while bragging about being a green bank and bragging about having Quaker roots. So I get down to the flower show and in the middle was this big PNC display. And when I came upon it, I found nine people, including some Quakers who I know, standing behind yellow crime scene tape, wearing black t-shirts that said in white writing, flower crimes division. 
to point out that this was a crime, what was happening to the mountains. And they were joyously singing, where have all the flowers gone, in the middle of the flower show. <clears throat> Security did not know what to do with these people. They tried to recruit the roving jazz band to distract everybody, but that just brought more attention to the protesters, who by now were singing, she'll be coming around the mountain. <laughs> and so they kind of shushed them away. I was really taken with this group. They seemed bold and creative and funny, and they seemed like they had hope. So I thought, I want to do something to support them. Now the thing you need to know is that I was not raised to do weird things in public places. I really wasn't. I went to all-girl Catholic school for 10 years. I was a Girl Scout for 13 years. In fact, my senior year of high school, I was the Girl Scout of the Year of Philadelphia. No kidding. <laughs> my mother did not raise me to do weird things in the flower show. And so I thought, oh, how can I support this group? I know, I'll write a blog post about them, which I did. But I didn't go to any meetings, I didn't join up, not for several months. The other turning point that came was watching in the news a global gathering of our world leaders in Durban, South Africa. And they were supposed to come up with a treaty to deal with climate change. And as in several times before, they just didn't get the job done. They were so busy arguing with each other. And at the end of the climate conference, I saw a video of a group of people sitting down in protest at the conference center. And some of them were being escorted out by security. And it just hit me, our leaders are not gonna solve this problem for us. Those folks are right. We have to make them do the right thing. And so a few days later, I went to my first Equate meeting. Now right away, this kind of activism felt really different than the peace rallies I had been to. We never went out on a grassy field and talked to each other. We went right in the bank. Sometimes we would bring the bank manager a jar of water from Appalachia to show the tap water, which was brown and murky, just like the water in Flint. And then that bank manager would have to make a choice whether to accept that jar of water or refuse to accept it. If we showed up and sang in a bank lobby or even sat down on the floor in a circle to have Quaker-style silent meeting for worship, they had to figure out what to do with us. Would they kick us out? Would they call the police on people for praying in the bank? We made them squirm in a way that my peace rallies never made George Bush squirm. And not just because we were inconvenient. We were modeling something different than business as usual. And so we were reminding them that they actually had a choice about what they invested in. Now, none of this was comfortable for most of us. It certainly wasn't comfortable for me. The scariest thing I ever did was just about two years ago, uh, we decided to go to a PNC shareholder meeting. And we had been going to them, and on this occasion we decided we wanted to make our presence known, but we didn't want to totally disrupt things. So we decided that we would pray in silence. And just so people knew what the heck we were doing, we printed t-shirts that said, praying for PNC to act responsibly. No money for mountaintop removal. And we wore jackets. I wore this jacket because that'll fool them, right? <laughs> Getting in. <clears throat> so we arrived, and a funny thing happened. They kept out everyone but me. I was the only person from our group who gets in. So here we are in this big hotel conference room. In the front on the stage is the CEO and the executive management team, mostly in blue suits. In the front row is the board of directors of the corporation. Now, this corporation that year netted $4.2 billion. And here's me with a t-shirt. <clears throat> I'm kind of looking at the door, wondering if anyone else is going to get in. Mom, can we go get ice cream? 
But then I looked up at the stage and I realized they were racing through their agenda. They were so scared about what we were going to do that they were just galloping through their own agenda. And I realized if I didn't stand up soon, I wasn't going to have a chance to. So I took a few deep breaths, looked at the door a few more times, and stood up, took off the jacket, the big t-shirt reveal, closed my eyes to pray, and the CEO closed the meeting. Less than a year later, PNC announced that they were pulling out of investments in mountaintop removal coal mining, and they cited health reasons, something that at the beginning they said they would never make an investment decision based on anything but money. But in the end, they did the right thing, and they even said the reason why. You can clap for that. And remember this. In that year, they netted $4.2 billion. And our little group had an annual budget of 100000 No full-time staff, no office. We had persistence and chutzpah. This kind of activism has made me hopeful long before we actually won because I could feel that it was different and I could actually see that other groups are doing similar things. The climate movement in the last few years has had many victories and it's the reason that President Obama in his second term has done a lot more about climate change. It's the reason that on the world scale in Paris this last December our world leaders finally came up with a treaty. It's not enough, but it's way better than what they had done before because around the world, people are telling their governments, we need you to figure this out. We need you to take steps in the right direction. Part of what I've learned is that that's the way change has always happened. You know, people here, Rosa Parks was tired and she sat down on the bus. No, that is not the real story. The African-American community of Montgomery was tired of segregation, and they were tired of cooperating with it. People chose to walk, to work, to church, to the store, rather than ride on segregated buses. They did that for over a year. Dr. King said that people traded in tired souls for tired feet. If you think more recently of the sea change in the LGBT movement, which was really led by ordinary people saying, I'm not going to stay in the closet any longer. First a few courageous folks and then a groundswell of people coming out to their families, to their faith communities, in their workplaces. In both of those cases, the Supreme Court eventually came down on the right side. But that only happened after ordinary people shifted the culture, after ordinary people showed them what the right side was. Realizing that people have the ability to choose whether or not to cooperate with things that they disagree with has been incredibly empowering. And it's changed the way I look at things. I want to end with one last story from just two weeks ago. I went down to a hearing on an oil port in Philadelphia. And when I went in, the Union Hall had probably about 200 people sitting in chairs over here. And then there were three folks sitting up on a stage over here. And they were the folks from the Port Authority. And there was a microphone kind of almost in the middle. And one by one, people from the community were coming up and speaking about why they were against an oil port, about asthma, about health effects, about climate change. Some folks talked about jobs. And every time someone asked a question, some of the questions and testimony were great, but the questions all kind of boiled down to, are you going to listen to us? And the folks on the stage each time said, yeah, yeah, we're going to listen to you in a really long-winded way that gave them way too much airtime. And so when I got up to the microphone, I realized I had a choice. 
I could face them, but instead I just moved my body a little so I could face both. And I spoke to the people on the stage and the people in the seats. And at the end, I said, I'm not going to ask you guys a question. You've gotten enough questions. I'm going to ask these folks a question. And I asked, are we going to let them divide us? Because that's what they always do. They divide folks who want clean air and folks who want green jobs, as if, uh, good jobs, as if we don't all want both. And the 200 people shouted back, no. And I realized after that that moment kind of symbolized what's changed for me. I used to think that power was there, and all I could do was convince it or replace it. But I realized that I believe that the power is there, and here, and here. My invitation to you tonight is to think about what are the issues that make your soul tired, the things you don't want to cooperate with, Who are the people that you could work with to change things? And my encouragement is for you to claim your power because we have more power than we know and the world really needs us to use it. Thank you.